Today I'll be talking to you about a topic that's incredibly important to me and hopefully just as important to you, and that's practice. In this video, I'll be talking about a few topics, including slow practice, repetitions, and maintaining a practice log. A few years ago, I had the great classical guitarist Zorn Dukic come to my school to teach some of the students in a master class. During one of the students' lessons, Zoran told the student, I'll bet you lunch that I can play this passage that you're playing right now perfect with all the correct left and right hand fingerings. Everyone looked at him like he was crazy. It was a really difficult piece and we really didn't know how he was going to pull it off. He then proceeded to play that section of the piece at an incredibly slow tempo, probably the slowest that me or anyone in the class had ever heard. To demonstrate how slow he was actually playing, I'm going to play a passage from a really popular classical guitar piece. First, here it is at a uh, normal tempo. And here it is at around the speed that Zoran played in the master class that day. and so on. So as you can see, he was playing it really slow. Everyone thought it was hilarious, but he was able to prove his point that by playing that slow, he was able to hyper-focus on his right hand fingerings, the movements of his right hand, and correct placement of his left hand fingerings as well. More importantly, when you practice that slow, not only are you able to pay attention to all of your right and left hand fingerings and dynamics and rhythm, but you're also able to analyze all of the movements that we make when we do play the guitar. You can also ask yourself some of these questions when you're practicing slow. Are we keeping our muscles relaxed? Are they moving in the most efficient way? How do our hands feel when we're playing the guitar? And how does our posture look, especially when you practice in front of a mirror? Practicing super slow will greatly benefit your technique and musicality, and we'll also give you a chance to take a look at all the mechanics that go behind the practice that we do. You are also cultivating all the correct habits, so when you do gradually increase the tempo to a performance speed, you'll know exactly what to do. Slow practice doesn't mean that you should zone out. You should still be incredibly mindful of everything that you're doing and be in the moment. This is part of practicing efficiently. You can spend six to eight hours in the practice room, but many of those hours can be spent cruising on Facebook, Instagram, looking out the window, taking walks, finding any excuse that you can to not be there. But if you just sat there and focused on your practice, you can probably get everything and more done in just two hours. Next, I'd like to talk about repetition. I'm sure all of you have heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. I would like all of you to replace that phrase today with a new one. Practice makes permanent. What does that mean? Repetition permanently changes our brain's circuits. So when you sit down to practice a really hard section of a piece that you're working on, how many times should you repeat it? If you play it once or twice and then go on to a new section, that's just not going to cut it. All of the little musical details and complex mechanics of playing guitar will eventually become effortless when doing repetitions. This is of course assuming that you're repeating with proper technique and fingerings and not developing bad habits through repetition. For example, I've told many of my students in the past that in order to learn the next section of a piece, they need to be able to repeat at least 10 times the previous section. Many of these times, I've seen students repeat that section 10 times with different left hand fingerings, different right hand fingerings, and even sometimes uh, wrong notes. While yes, they are repeating that section 10 times in a row, they're doing it improperly and they're programming it into their brain the wrong way. Going back to our first point again, slow practice helps us control what we repeat and will help us develop good, healthy, long-term habits. In the third point, I'd like to talk about how to maintain a practice log. All you need for a practice log is a notebook and a pencil. 
In my practice log, I like to put the repertoire that I'm currently working on and stuff that needs review, as well as some technique like scales, arpeggios, and even some reading exercises. Keeping a practice log will help you maintain your time. For instance, if I have a concert coming up and I look at my practice log and I see that I'm spending 90% of my time working on technique, then I know that since my concert is next week, that I probably should be spending more time working on the music that I'm gonna be performing in that concert. So the next day I can adjust and spend 90% of the time on repertoire and just 10% of the time on technique. Keeping a practice log doesn't have to be daunting. It could be incredibly simple. Just start off with a couple of key points in your practice sessions each day and then build it from there. If you don't wanna use a notebook, there are a ton of apps that you can get on your phone or iPad that will help you log your practice. Lastly, I'd like to bring up that when you do practice, don't overdo it and make sure that you're always having fun. Also try setting some time aside to record yourself. You can share these recordings with your friends and family or post them on social media so everyone around the world can see what you're working on. This can be highly motivational and keep you engaged to continue practicing. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope these tips really help you and that you can incorporate them into your everyday practice. All right, welcome back to my four part series on right hand preparation. We've practiced preparation in arpeggios going up and not preparing when we go back down. We've practiced complex preparation techniques without some of the fingers, like in this case, and where we skip strings, like in Villa Lobos 8 number one. Now we're going to be looking at two other versions of preparation, and that is when you only have one finger prepared on one of the strings, and the others are playing on other strings. This is sometimes called planting by some people. I, pre I prefer the name preparation generally, but if you hear planting and I don't know what it means, usually they are referring to something like this. So, um, so far we've only really been talking about arpeggio patterns, but the truth is that of course there are many more options, many more pattern possibilities that are not arpeggios. For example, in the famous um, Asturias or Leyenda by Isaac Albeniz, uh, which starts like this. We have a repeated pattern, bass, followed by the second string. You know, it doesn't even matter what you do with the left hand. But we have a repeated pattern that's not an arpeggio, it's just melody plus accompaniment. Uh, in this situation, if you were to play this, and feel free to follow along with the left hand, if you can't, if that's not a piece that you've played, no worries at all. Uh, but in this piece, we basically don't ever need to use the first string until much further into the second section of this piece. Everything we're playing is in the fifth to the second string. So you let's even ignore the left hand for now. Uh, you have a bass followed by the second string. Sometimes the bass changes strings. That's even that's irrelevant right now. Basically, when you do this. If you just play these two notes and you don't have any other contact point with the guitar, you risk not knowing where the strings are or getting confused, especially in the high stress situations such as being on stage. If I were to just play these two notes without any preparation or planting, uh, I would be doing this basically. And it's super easy for my big and strong thumb to move my hand around. It's super easy for my hand to dance or in the case of being on stage, it's super easy for my hand to shake, for me to have tension in the hand where I'm not supposed to. And so it's really, really, really easy to mess up. No matter how good you are at guitar, it is hard to do that correctly. So what we can do is try to find a finger that can stay and maintain contact with one of the strings without messing with the melody we're playing. In the case of Asturias, of this beginning, the finger that you wanna look at is your A finger, your ring finger. Since you don't need the first string, you can just prop this A finger on the first string here and just hold it there without tension, no, no pushing it in aloud, just no tension at all, as if you're going to play this note with, with it. Just hold it there at the beginning of the pattern and for the entirety of this first section of the piece, you can then play 
some cases, some people play P I P I P I P I. By the way, if you do P I, you are also able to use the middle finger for the first string instead of the ring finger. I personally tend to play P M, and so I tend to place the ring finger on the top string and then do P M here. And yes, for the actual Asturias, your string in the bass will change sometimes, but this doesn't change the fact that you can still place the first, the the the, the ring finger on the first string here and just leave it there. If you can play the Asturias, then practice the Asturias with this finger on the first string. If you cannot, then just practice this as open strings with an exercise, as an exercise. I do a, a little extra trick and that is that sometimes I, I prepare the, the middle finger together with the thumb as well. You can't do it too much or it becomes obvious that the note gets cut, but in this situation you have this resonance from the bass, so you kind of can get away with it a little bit more. But generally what I want to talk about here is just a finger can go on the first string if you don't need it and that can help you. The opposite can happen where the thumb stays on a bass that is not being used and the other fingers play. This more contact with the guitar does not mean it is harder. I know that as humans, you're not born with a guitar in your hand, so you're not, it feels like it's more work to have more contact with the guitar, but the truth is that the more contact you have, the easier it becomes to play. So if you, for example, have to play something like E, B, E, B, E, B, E, B, you can't really prepare very well because it's a descending arpeggio, which, as I said, is harder to prepare, and also, you know, it's cutting the music away, it's cutting the sounds away, which can be distracting if these are the only two notes you have to play. So in a situation where you have to alternate between the first and second strings, what you can do is you can place your thumb here in the fifth string, for example, the fifth, it can be the sixth or the fourth, but let's take the fifth now as a middle ground, uh, and you can then play these two notes on top, while maintaining some contact with the guitar using this, this finger, right? So you can plant, or better said, prepare your thumb, or you can prepare your ring finger by itself on a top string. If you then, if you prepare your fingers correctly, then all of these really virtuosic passages are just not gonna be a problem at all because your hand will always have the same shape, your finger will ensure that it doesn't move too far away from it, and you're just gonna add that extra layer of security that's so important for you on stage. The only way that I can feel secure on stage is by choosing a sort of fingering that makes me feel secure. I could not play securely if I tried to do any other thing. Practice this until next time and I'll catch you in the final session for some examples, some more examples of real life pieces that you can apply these uh, ideas in. Welcome to Jeffy TV and we're talking left hand studies. This is TY. A steady and firm improvement is based on daily practice of the fundamental exercises. The more time we invest in them, the more stability and confidence we will get. I also recommend to use some of the exercises before each time we perform or practice music. A ballet dancer stretches before dancing and the athletes warms up before playing on the fields. These exercises could become very useful in times of preparation for performance. And last time we have explored how to be more flexible with left hand vibrato to imitate the magical human voice, but how to develop each finger to be more powerful. Today, let's look at a very tricky technique, the left hand hammer and slurs. A lot of information to cover, so let's get right into it. So first, let's start with hammer. The hammer movement is break down into three separate moves. The lift, the hammer, and the relax. Let's first try to put our hand on top of the sixth string, first fret. We're going to do this move. So the first move is playing right hand while lifting the target finger. In this case, it's first finger, point finger. Lifting, second beat, hammer down, third beat, and disconnect your power completely. And don't 
leave your finger away from the the string. Don't lift it. Just just relax, laying on the string without any power on the third beat. Okay. So one lift, two hammer, three relax. So how do we lift the fingers? So we're going to lift the fingers with majority the pivot on our third joint, third joint, bottom joint of our fingers. So we're lifting while the finger is still curled and the fingertip is still aiming down to the targeted string. Think of a snake. The snake head is like this, right? No snake will be like this. Okay, uh, so now the first beat is going to be lifting and remember the fingertip is still pointing down to target and hammer and relax. We are going to practice this starting with metronome speed 60. So lift, hammer, relax, lift, hammer, relax, one, two. Relax. Lift two, hammer two, relax. Lift three, hammer three, relax. Lift three, hammer three, relax. Lift, hammer, relax. Lift, hammer, relax. Okay? So this is the routine for each and every strings we should try. And then we can keep going on to the fifth string all the way to the first string. Now, let's talk about slurs. Slurs also three movement. So first, let's try to put in slurs because we will have a pulling finger and a targeted finger, a finger being pulled. So put both fingers on the string, hold both of them firmly. Okay, so three and four, uh, third and fourth fret, bottom string, this two. Okay, so the first beat is going to be play, the second beat, we're going to use a technique called left hand rest stroke. Rest your fourth finger down to fifth string after you pull. So, like this. We're not going to be plugged into the open air. Okay, so plug. Think of the direction that you're pulling both down to the next string and also into the fretboard into your palm. It's down motion. Okay, and then relax. Stay on the next string, relax. And next pair. So, relax, play, pull, relax. When you relax, keep the fingers down here, okay? And keep doing two, one, same. So, press, pull, and then I suggest each movement, um, each move, we repeat once. So it's going to be twice each. Okay, so for slurs, it's very important for the targeted finger, the finger being pulled too, to maintain, hold your position, maintain your ground. What I mean is, we don't want to do this. We don't want to pull both fingers at the same time, same direction. The finger being pulled to, in this case, the ring finger, need to hold your position, be firm, and watch your strings. Let your strings to maintain centered, not going down or up. Okay, so this is the slur exercise. Four, pull, relax. Play, pull, relax. Play, rest stroke, relax. Remember to rest stroke and stay on the string. Next pair. See, all the fingers are maintained on the resting position. Okay. Very well. Now, let's combine both exercises. Four steps. First beat, lift. Second beat, hammer. Third beat, pull, rest stroke. And last beat, fourth beat, we're going to rest. Left, hammer, pull, rest. Okay, next one. Lifting, hammer, pull, relax.
relax. Lifting, hammer, pull, relaxed. It's very easy. It's very hard to separate the muscle directions. Okay, now apply that exercises into every string. So the hard thing about this is to have the patience and persistency to constantly pay attention and feel how your muscle separate the different movements. It's very important to sink in the track of every movement into your bones, into your muscles, into your fingertips. And then when we're playing, gradually playing faster and faster, at very rapid speed, we will still maintain these little details that makes the movement crisp, accurate, and in control. See you in the next episode. Hi everyone, welcome to lesson three in this series of lessons about composing and songwriting. So, Right now, we're going to get into some material that's going to sound more familiar maybe than freely choosing your notes as we did in the previous two lessons. This is about chord playing. It's about finding different ways to play the chords. The most common fundamental chord that we use in every style is called the triad. It has three notes in it. All of your open chords that you play, if you play chords like, you know, D here, G, E minor. These are all triad chords because they only have three different notes in them. And I'm going to leave it to your teachers to explain to you which three notes and why those three notes. All you need to know right now to do this is know that there's three notes in the chords that you play probably very naturally that you learned from your friends or at school. And there are different ways to play those chords. The reason that that matters is really related to the parameters of sound that we've been covering in the previous two weeks. It makes the chord sound different. It has a different character or a different color to it. For example, this is your D chord that you might know. Maybe one of the first chords that you learned if you learned to strum. Right? Here are the three notes in the D chord. Here's your D. You've got an F sharp in there. And you've got an A. What that means is that where those three notes exist that I could grab them, that's a D chord. So on each set of three adjacent strings, you can play this chord in three ways because you could put a different note on the bottom and rearrange those notes. So here's one way. Here's another way. And here's another way. They're all D chords. So anytime you want to play a D chord, you could play any one of those fingerings, and that's what makes it really cool. Because if you had a band, or if you had a song, and someone was strumming, you could go ahead. You could play that one, right? You could play any of them that you want. Maybe if you want an accent that really pops, super bright, that's a great one because it's high, right? If you want to do like maybe a little finger picking thing, that one in the middle is really cool for that because it's got that nice mid range and you can still add the open D in the bass right there. So that's what they're used for. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to find them and then what to do with them when you find them. If learning the guitar fingerboard is new for you, just bear with me. If you already have a handle on it, you can move down to the other string sets as well. So, here's the pieces of information you need to know. You need to know what notes are in the chord that you want to move around. And you need to know how to find those notes on the string. I'm also going to give you some shapes of the chords because the shapes repeat no matter what chord you're playing. So you can know where the name of the chord note is, the root note in the chord, and then move your shape. Ultimately, you want to be able to identify all the notes in the chord because that's going to help you as you get to know the guitar better. So here on 
the top string set, one through three, we've got A here, because this is the third string, we're gonna walk up a half step on each fret until we get to A in the musical alphabet. Again, ask your teacher if that doesn't make sense to you. You've got an A, you've got a D, and you've got an F sharp. What we're gonna do next is find another place to play the D, maybe on the third string. So I'm gonna walk up, I'm gonna go, okay, here's G, here's A, whole step to B, half step to C, and then a whole step to D. And then here's my F sharp. I could walk right up to it on the B string. And then here's my A right here. I could walk right up to it from the E string. This is the shape for the D chord that we call root position because the D, the name of the chord, is in the bottom. Then there's one more shape. So we've had A on the bottom. Looks like that. We've had D on the bottom. And now we're going to put F sharp on the bottom. So keep walking up until you get to F sharp, which is right here. And then you're going to walk up your other strings and find that there's an A here on the 10th fret, and there's D here on the 10th fret. There's your third D chord. All of the chords can do that. Watch, I'm going to do it on the middle string set. Here's a D, here's a D, and here's a D. I'm going to do it on the next string set. Here's a D, here's a D, here's a D. And then I'm going to do it down one more. Here's a D, here's a D, and here's another D. See how fast I did that? It's because I knew where the notes were on the fingerboard and I also learned those shapes for those chords. So I'm gonna send those to you at the end of this. I'll put a little sheet with all of them on there. This is the kind of thing it allows you to do. If you know this band Led Zeppelin, they wrote this really cool song called Stairway to Heaven and this was the chord progression in the middle. Jimmy Page played that, this is what he did with it. You hear how cool that sounds when you use a, the chords in a different place? Instead of playing D, E minor, D, C, and D up in a different position like the first one we learned. He did E minor, D, C. So these are great movable shapes. They're super useful. So I'm gonna give you the sheet. And what I want you to do is just take a chord you know and try to put it in a different place on the neck. See what that inspires you to write. And when you're there, see if you can learn what notes are under your fingers. It's a lot to practice, but I know you can do it. Have a great week, and next week we'll start to put these things together into a song of your own. Thanks.
Thank you.